Bye. All right, thank you very much, Alex. Thank you all for joining. Would not be a virtual webinar without some kind of potential hiccup. So thanks to Alex and Jenny, who've been working very hard to get these kinds of programs together for their patients and last minute scrambling. And thank you all for joining us today. As Alex said, this was supposed to be Ticket to the 20s weekend. The last couple of years in particular, we've had great attendance, great program elements. And so the best we can do right now is try to give you a little bit of a, of a small sampling of some of life in the 1920s. And there were some hiccups on my own end, uh, some schedule issues. So I was hoping to share some maps and documents and other kinds of artifacts. Today, it's gonna to be strictly photographs, which I assume will be okay. And we'll go ahead and get started then. So by taking a tour through the 20s, this will be a, what I would refer to maybe as a snapshot of life in greater Los Angeles during that period. We can't be comprehensive or cover a huge amount of ground, but we can certainly make our way around the region, talk about many things that were happening in very different areas of life. And you can see some examples here in the screen. Uh, some things we we'll talking about, whether it's economics or race and ethnicity and just general life in the 20s. So our itinerary is to start in downtown Los Angeles. We'll hop into our jalopy here. And of course, we're social distancing and wearing our masks, so we don't have to be that close to each other. And then we'll take our trip through the region during this really fascinating decade. We'll start in Los Angeles and then we'll make our way out to the suburbs as well. Here's an aerial photograph from the very late 1920s. If you had had the ability to get a bird's eye view, uh, from before that, say early part of the 19th, uh, 20th century or back in the 19th century, you'd have a much smaller uh, area to look at in terms of developed area. But you can see the, the metropolis is fully engaged here. You can almost, you can see almost no open land at all. So we're south of downtown. The biggest landmark, you can see the tallest building at the time up here at the top right is Los Angeles City Hall. Uh, a lot of the financial district down off of Main and Spring Street being over here. The, the shopping district, as they called it, off of 7th Street would be more over in this direction. Up here, the Elysian Hills, where Dodger Stadium is today. And then you get back towards Santa Monica Mountains, Hollywood being off to the left here, just to give you an idea of what, where we're looking at or which directions we are looking at. And I should mention, too, also the industrial corridor along the Los Angeles River uh, over in this direction, where a lot of artists and others are today. So the growth of the City of Angels was dramatic during the 1920s as it had been in the first years of the 20th century, as it had been in the 1880s. We had a period uh, of boom followed by bust, you would see coming along every several years. And so here are some photos showing you some pretty good panoramas of parts of downtown Los Angeles where things are growing dramatically. Uh, residential areas are really moving out by this point to the suburbs outside of downtown. There are people living there, but it's, it's a lot different than it had been even 15 or 20 years prior to that. So on the right, for example, this is 7th Street, which was becoming the shopping corridor of the city in those years. Over here on the left, and I forgot which street this is, but uh, I, can, I know this is the Southern California Edison building. So a lot of obviously offices, corporate headquarters, that sort of thing in the city. Another view here, this is Broadway looking to the south. So you've got the old uh, county courthouse here on the left, um, Hall of Records next to that. And you're seeing again, uh, a really big developing area. A lot of these older buildings like this courthouse are gonna be going away soon and being replaced by modern structures. This is Pershing Square. So we are on Fifth and Hill Pershing Square off to the right, the Biltmore Hotel, you can't see, but it'll be off to the right. And over here on the left side is the uh, Temple Auditorium, which was the, the main concert venue for serious or classical music in those days. A couple of little details, a stoplight that had a sign that popped up that would tell you to stop or go. And this looks like it may be a police officer out there patrolling. They even had fake police officers, sort of cardboard cutouts to be in the middle of the street to slow people down and have them observe traffic laws when that was possible to do. And again, just some other really great views. You can see another one of those traffic signals here, actually. I think this might be on 6th Street. It looks like there's a barrier in the street, again, just to get drivers to, to watch pedestrians and watch their driving. You can see streetcars, as well as automobiles and pedestrians in these great views of downtown. 
Now, it wasn't just downtown, though, that, in which the city was expanding. There was annexation continually going on in the first decades of the 20th century. The city grew dramatically. The biggest area of annexation would be the San Fernando Valley, or most of it, in the course of those years. The shoestring going down to San Pedro and Wilmington and the port of Los Angeles. That was a, a, just before 1910. Other annexations would go to the west towards the ocean and in the northeast to a certain extent as well up towards Pasadena. The one area that did not expand was the city limits on the east side at Boyle Heights, Indiana Avenue, dividing Boyle Heights from county area. And this photo at the top, it was what was called Belvedere Heights in those years. It was changed to East Los Angeles because there was already an East Los Angeles that became Lincoln Heights. And that allowed for a name change of Belvedere Heights to East Los Angeles. Down here, one of the more important corridors to expand during these years, Wilshire Boulevard, the Miracle Mile and what have you, taking commuters from downtown Los Angeles out to Santa Monica and the coast and back. Great shot here on the top right of the San Fernando Valley from Topanga Canyon Road. So you can see again, just how rural and agricultural this all is in those years out in the farther reaches of the valley. Photo on the bottom left here shows you an area that's looking evidently towards Santa Monica Mountains. So I'm guessing this is probably just a little bit northwest of downtown looking north and northwest. So, you're, and you're seeing areas that uh, there's still some open space there, even though there is a good deal of residential development. Again, as people are moving further out from downtown, of course, they're going to go into these more far flung areas of the city. And the city did expand, again, significantly to the north and south. This is in the San Pedro area. And then on the bottom right here is this Tohunga. And so that area eventually became part of the city of Los Angeles, too, all the way up into Sun Valley, um, Tohunga, those areas. A big driver, of course, of growth will be population coming here because hopefully there will be jobs for them. And there was expansion in many different areas of the economy. And again, I'm just going to hit a few of the main points of this. The development of manufacturing and industry was pretty important. So you had entities like the big tire companies, just as one example, Firestone and Goodyear. These were companies based in the industrial Midwest. They were still there as their headquarters, but they realized by the 1920s that Los Angeles had grown enough, had enough of a labor force and open space, good weather, all of those conditions that were beneficial to that to open up these facilities. So Firestone, this is a, the groundbreaking ceremony for their plant southeast of downtown. And uh, you can see the huge crowd and all that. And just behind, open space, some ho homes here and there, but this will be an industrial quarter to the southeast. The old quarter next to the Los Angeles River in downtown was built up. So they had to find other places to go to develop their industrial capacity. Down here in the bottom, you've got the, the clock tower, which is a pretty nice architectural feature for a factory uh, for Goodyear tire and rubber, again, uh, on the outskirts, meaning outside of downtown Los Angeles. In downtown, what you're seeing increasingly would be things like this, lots of office work, professionals, uh, real estate companies, insurance companies, stockbrokers, that sort of thing. So this is a real estate firm office in 1924 in downtown. These are reporters, you can tell from the headgear, hopefully, for the Los Angeles News, which was a paper started by one of their Vanderbilts. It didn't last particularly long. It was pretty competitive here in Los Angeles with the Times and the Herald, the Examiner and the Express and other, other papers, but this is a 1923 photograph. So these are the kinds of entities you would see in a lot of the downtown office buildings. Another big driver of the local economy was the development and the growth of the oil industry. In 1892, 93, thereabouts, Edward Doheny and Charles Canfield opened up the Los Angeles oil field adjacent to downtown, about where the 101 and the 110 meet. And that was the beginning of the Los Angeles City oil field. And then over time, especially to the west within city boundaries, you're going to start seeing expansion of oil development to the point that if there's a street there, they'll go ahead and put a derrick right in the middle of the street. And I've forgotten which one this was. Somebody may know who's tuning in here. Um, but you get an example of that. This one I do know because of the, of the tar pit. So this is out on Rancho La Brea, where the Page Museum and LACMA are today, the LA County Museum of Art. A young lady pointing over in that direction. But you can see the oil wells going in. So there's a lot of that happening in that uh, western part of the city. And we'll talk about other oil development throughout the region outside of city limits. 
Another huge one, obviously, would be the film industry coming into the area just before 1910 and dramatically expanding as time goes on and also outside of city limits. Now, Hollywood had been an independent city at one point, but was absorbed and annexed into Los Angeles. This is the Fox Studios. You also have Universal City. You've got out in Culver City where MGM wound up going to, lots of other uh, film studios. The industry had started in the uh, area to the north of downtown LA and a little bit to the west, the Silver Lake Uncle Park area, but was making dramatic strides throughout uh, the areas uh, around Los Angeles, including parts of the San Fernando Valley. Uh, oh. Film shop. Yes, go ahead. We had a question that came in just to clarify, where, where was Wrigley Field West located? I am going to talk about that. So Excellent. hang tight. All right. We'll go out and see where the LA Angels were playing. So we'll do that. Uh, film shoot here. This is, I, I believe, a, a Little Rascals Our Game comedy from the late 1920s. And so there's lots of fun photographs you can see in different collections of shooting out on the streets during those, in that era. And then because you've got this enormous growth in the economy, the transportation element is pretty important. The railroads had been fairly well established by 1900 as far as access to and from Los Angeles. What really was becoming obviously more important was building a basically a man-made harbor. There had been from the early days of the Spanish and Mexican periods, anchorage of ships offshore here at San Pedro Wilmington, but really offshore. They, in fact, about a mile in many cases, they have to bring smaller craft in because of the shallowness and the, and the sandbars and all that. So starting in the 1870s, federal appropriations began to take place to improve this, building breakwaters, expanding port facilities with man-made uh, islands and peninsulas and doing the docks and all that. And of course, today it's much, much bigger than all this. And you've got Long Beach adjacent as well. But this is an early view of the San Pedro and Wilmington areas as they're starting in the first decade of the 20th century to really build a significant uh, port to handle all the traffic that's going to be going in and out of the area. And another photo down here at the bottom from the 20s where you see the railroad lines being built there and warehouses and other facilities as part of the development of the Port of Los Angeles. And of course, real estate is going to be pretty significant too. People are coming out here. And so whether they're going to be working for companies that are going to be building plants and facilities, this is a commercial structure, for example, being built in downtown Los Angeles or finding a home, whatever that may be, uh, modest, uh, working in middle-class homes on the east side of South Los Angeles, uh, upper wealthier enclaves in, on the west side, or in this case, Hollywood land, which was a development that was very successful in the mid 1920s, very interesting kinds of architecture. They had buses that would take you up to the, to the area to show you the, the model homes and what have you. And you can see a little bit of the sign back here in the back, that red Hollywood land, and now today just says Hollywood. People still think that that sign was built for the film industry. It was built for this track development. And when that was built out, then it became the Hollywood sign that we all know today. Lots of other industries, just to give you some examples. Aviation is obviously huge. Los Angeles in early 1910 hosted the first real big time air meet in, in the United States. And from that point on, people obviously recognize that with the climate and weather and with the open spaces, that there was a lot of opportunity to expand aviation out here. Same thing with the film industry because of the weather and, and other aspects, it just made more sense to do a lot of that in this area. The onset of technology, so you've got, or new technology, so the radio, for example. So this is a shot of KNX, one of the first radio stations to begin operating just in the very early part of the 1920s and dramatic expansion over the course of that decade. Naturally, the automobile just becomes a bigger and bigger part of our local way of living, much less the economics of it. So the first automobiles start to come in at the very end of the, of the 1800s and we become the car capital of the world very, very quickly. So a shot of an auto garage, the, the economic impact obviously was huge. Now we had agriculture still happening within city boundaries, but increasingly it's becoming pushed out to outlying areas because of the development going on. So what you start really seeing happening in the city, especially in the east side of downtown is the development of the wholesale aspect of that. So fruit, flowers, other kinds of produce, really become centralized out there and outline areas are sending their products in to these wholesale markets for distribution. So this is an example of one of those facilities there. 
Now, as an area with a booming economy and a growing population, you're going to want people to have things to do for fun. So this is one of our major themes at the homestead. On the upper left, I showed you a photograph earlier taken from right about this corner, looking out this direction. Now we're uh, looking on Fifth Street westward from Grand. I think it's Grand. And so here's Pershing Square. On the lower left, you get that temple auditorium I mentioned before that was a uh, concert hall. A new building just very recently was finished there. And out here was where the LA Central Public Library uh, wound up being built and completed in 1926. On the bottom right, people often don't see this kind of photograph. This is the Hollywood Bowl when it had one of its early designs before the shell that we're all used to seeing today. There were several different elements of the band shell that they worked on during the 1920s before they settled on the one that we see today. And of course, you can still see it looks very rural out here in uh, Hollywood during that period of time. And even our museum world is starting to expand dramatically uh, in the early part of the 19th or 20th century. And so we had the development of the Los Angeles Museum of History, Science and Art, basically your all purpose, one stop museum facility that became the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County years later once the County Museum of Art was opened up on the Miracle Mile off Wilshire in the 1960s. Charles Fletcher Loomis, one of the more interesting characters of this era, in fact, he died in 1928, was the founding force of the Southwest Museum of the American Indian out in Highland Park. That structure is still there. There's a lot of debate about what to do with it as the Autry Museum is responsible for that. But this is an early photo of that hilltop museum. Sports, so we're getting there uh, for that question earlier. This is Ascot Park a racing facility. It started as a horse racing facility in South Los Angeles and then moved to a couple of different locations after that. One of them was up towards El Sereno as you make your way out of downtown to the Northeast. So you can see an auto race here from the 1920s. The development of the Los Angeles Coliseum, Memorial Coliseum built to, as a memorial to those who fought in World War I. And this is a, a huge achievement, a very big stadium with a large capacity as it remains today. And you can see a football game going on here from this aerial view. So again, just some examples of what people were doing for sports entertainment. So here's your, here's your Wrigley Field, which was uh, built in the 20s. Uh, there was a uh, move by, William, uh, by uh, uh, William Wrigley, who bought Santa Catalina Island. And just after that, he thought, because he had the Cubs, Chicago Cubs, which he owned, the, the National League baseball team, he had them go out and do some, some uh, training on Catalina. And so he thought it would be a good idea to invest in baseball kind of on a permanent or uh, basis. So he built uh, Wrigley Field in uh, just south of downtown in, in, uh, in Los Angeles. So this is a great shot from I think about 1927 or thereabouts of a game being held out there. And I can get the exact address and all that if the person wants to contact me by email, we'll get that up there in the, in the chat or something like that and give you that detail. But it's uh, South Los Angeles. I'm, I wanna say 42nd Street and, and I forgot the cross street, but I can get that for you. You don't see a lot about women's sports in this period. Um, so it was, it was kind of fun to find this photograph of a lacrosse game at the Coliseum and I think this is a college game. I've forgotten which two, which two uh, colleges this was, but uh, an example of a very rare example that, I, that you rarely that you don't see very often of women's sports out here. Lots of other attractions. Before we had the Los Angeles Zoo, there was a film studio owner, Zelig, uh, S-E-L-I-G. And Zelig had his zoo that was really to house the animals that he used for the motion picture side of things but he quickly realized a way to have the zoo bring in people, make some money, give some visibility to his studio was to develop the zoo. So this is over in the um, Lincoln Heights area and it was renamed Luna Park Zoo uh, in the late 1920s. Beautiful entrance here and all that. And some of these elephants not that long ago were, were found in storage way out, I think in Fontana or something like that. So um, I believe maybe one or two of these maybe at the LA Zoo now come to think of it, but an attraction out there. Lincoln Heights had a number of these zoos or farms, an alligator farm. And the only reason these ladies could do this is because you can see that the alligator's mouth was being held shut. This is the kind of treatment of animals we don't see today. Uh, and of course, zoos are under scrutiny all the time as it is. 
but these were popular things. There's an ostrich farm located at this location or this facility in Lincoln Heights, as well as the Costin ostrich farm just out city, uh, outside city limits in South Pasadena. So a number of interesting places like this. And again, we wouldn't see those kinds of things happening today for sure. Now, we don't think of this as being as common today. In other words, park space is very, very difficult to uh, find for people now, but there was a movement from about the mid 1880s until about 1900, where the city invested a tremendous amount of energy, effort, and money to developing very fine parks throughout the city. A lot of this was done to help drive residential development. So when you have, for example, an area that had a lot of uh, you know, poor soil, it didn't seem like a good place to build, then the idea was to establish Westlake Park out there. And that in turn drove residential development later on. The park was really there before much else got to that section of the city. And this is one example. This is Holland Beck Park in Boyle Heights. And Boyle Heights was started in the 1870s by William Henry Workman, a nephew of the Workman family at the homestead and a couple of partners of his. And one of the investors was a guy named John Hollenbeck, who died young, so this park was established in his name. But it also helped to drive development in that area, including property owned by Hollenbeck's widow and by William H. Workman. There were many other facilities like that. Uh, Griffith Park being probably the best known, largest park by far in the city, one of the biggest in the United States. This is the eastern entrance to the park. You can see a, an automobile here and a, and a sign about when the, the park was closed and all that. And there was a lesion and uh, Lincoln Park and many others that were built in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and, and really helped give Los Angeles an impetus to development as well as having recreation. There were occasional private facilities that were open to the public. This is one of the more famous ones out in Hollywood. It was called Yamashiro, restaurant by that name, uh, came out there later on. The Bernheimer brothers who came out from New York and built the, this really amazing replica of a, a Japanese uh, facility with amazing gardens and all that. So you occasionally have these private uh, gardens that were open up for public use. There were a few other examples like that in the region. Again, it's always interesting to talk about the different elements of life. Los Angeles had a reputation by the 1920s as being a place where, well, they used to say that, that LA was a land of fruits and nuts. And by fruits, they meant oranges and lemons. By nuts, they meant different people with interesting ideas. And that could pertain to religion. It could be all kinds of other things. But there were a, a lot of interesting developments in the religious world back then. Um, the pilgrimage play, which was actually staged by a Jewish woman working with uh, Christians. And that was very popular, held up in uh, the area near the Hollywood Bowl, performed for quite a long time, very successful play. Amy Semple McPherson, one of the more notorious and popular evangelical figures. So this is an era of really the, from 1900 onwards where different forms of evangelical religion, the holiness churches, Pentecostals, that sort of thing. And there was a lot of room for that in Los Angeles, even though outsiders might joke about how kind of strange we were out here, but her Angeles Temple up in Echo Park being a, a very big uh, draw for her brand of evangelical uh, missionary work. And just some other sort of odd, not odd, but to different kinds of examples of things. So a lot of people don't know, we had a, a hot springs fed pool just outside of downtown Los Angeles called Bimini. The Bimini Hot Springs was used for quite a long time. And one of the areas that we still have with us, but doesn't get as much attention as it used to, was the National Soldier's Home out in what was then called Sautel, which was an independent city for a while. And again, annexed into the city of Los Angeles, out by Westwood and UCLA. And so the VA is out there and the National Cemetery and those kinds of elements. This is also an area, as I said before, of a lot of interesting developments with technology and aviation, whether it was Charles Lindbergh visiting Los Angeles in September 1927 after completing his solo transatlantic flight. He had huge crowds. Uh, it's, it's really, he was sort of one of the very first mega celebrities of our modern era. And uh, his visit here was, was very, very uh, popular. Another interesting element of the aviation part of it was the arrival of the Graf Zeppelin in the summer, late summer of 1929 over at a place called Mines Field, which became Los Angeles International Airport. I believe this is a Goodyear blimp that was, was starting to be utilized back then in the area. And of course, the, the end of the Zeppelins happened in 1937 with the disaster at, at Lakehurst, New Jersey. 
another shot of minefield. We had a national air races in September 1928. That was another big signal event to promote and popularize aviation in this area. There are air races held for several years in different parts of the country, Cleveland, for example, the next year. But this was a, a pretty important benchmark for aviation history. We really can't go by the 1920s without mentioning something regarding prohibition, which was largely honored in the breach. In other words, people were usually able to evade a lot of the restrictions that prohibition brought in, but there were occasional busts. We have a few photographs in our collection like this one where the authorities have swooped in, they've got the press out there to take a photograph so they can you know, demonstrate to the public that they're on the job doing what they can. But of course it was a pretty thankless task. And this is the late 1920s by 1933. It had decide, been decided that the amendment to the constitution to, to try to ban most consumption and production of alcohol was no longer workable. It's just strange things. The twenties sometimes gets thought of as flagpole sitters and dance marathons. And it was an era where people had emerged from the first world war, really scarred by the experience and looking for ways to escape, uh, enjoy life more, that sort of thing. There was kind of a, a inward turning politically, geopolitically for sure. And so some of that kind of manifests itself in some of the unusual things people did back then. There were lots of daredevil stunts. People were committing this guy climbing a building. If I remember correctly, I think he actually wound up falling just after this photo was taken and, 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 and killed himself. Um, so stuff that you see today, people doing strange things to take selfies or whatever it is. We, humans have a habit sometimes of behaving strangely. Uh, this is a kind of a fun photograph of a dance marathon where they decided to pair the tallest participants, you know, both seven feet plus with a so-called average size couple and dance marathons were hugely popular throughout the United States. And this is just one local example, but you have beauty pageants and uh, all kinds of different things happening that show a change in how people are looking at uh, their leisure time and uh, entertainment. So now we're gonna hop in another, this one's covered, another tour bus, and we're gonna go out to the suburbs and take a look and see what is going on out there. Now that we've got a decent picture, hopefully, of what Los Angeles was doing during the 20s. So as Los Angeles's population about doubled between 1920 and 1930, the county's population had a similar type of very significant growth. A lot of areas that had been citrus ranches or citrus groves that had been farms and ranches were becoming developed, plowed under to build new suburban areas or expanding ones that had been there before. So this is an example of one that had been there for a while, El Monte in the 1920s. It had a significant amount of growth for its community. This is uh, Main Street, which I think now is uh, what they call Valley Mall, going through downtown. Walter P. Temple, who owned the homestead in during this period, develops the town of Temple. That's what the sign says here on the, on the top of this bank building, renamed Temple City in 1928. The post office wanted a name change and looking up towards the majestic San Gabriel Mountains. So just a few years prior to this photograph, these had been bean fields. I think watermelon was grown there, that kind of stuff. So these former agriculture areas are increasingly being redeveloped. Other areas of, of the outlying suburbs. Now Long Beach had been around since the late 19th century, but had a huge explosion in population during the 20s. It really became a, a large uh, suburban city. You can see that definitely by the, the shoreline area here. To the north, the, the town of Compton. So again, this was a community that had been basically agricultural for quite a long time, but population is moving further and further south. In the 20s, Compton was almost completely white at that point, but there would be, of course, in subsequent decades, the movement of ethnic minorities outside of the uh, more centralized areas they've been living in, whether it was east side or just south of downtown Los Angeles. We'll talk more about that at the end. With agriculture, you still do, as you go further out, uh, San Fernando Valley, the, the northern foothill areas of the San Gabriel Valley, all the way out to San Bernardino, that orange uh, lemon groves are still very, very well developed, producing a lot of economic benefit. Uh, of course, what you don't hear a lot about are the people who would be in these groves doing the labor. You usually see pictures of the, of the trees without labor. You might see pictures of the owners or their houses. Very, off, very, few, very rare to see photos of the workers. This is out in Laverne in the eastern reaches of Los Angeles County. This photo is near what was called Puente, now La Puente, where walnuts were very popularly raised. So there was mixtures in some areas. In the La Puente Valley, you had oranges, 
avocados, lemons, but also a significant concentration of walnut growing, including on the homestead owned by uh, Walter P. Temple and his family. They had a commercial walnut grove there as well. Now for processing, you're gonna see, of course, a lot of packing houses. This one is, I think, Monrovia Duarte area uh, from maybe the earlier part of the 20th century. The Lemon Association packing house in San Dimas. In Puente, they had the world's largest walnut packing house completed, I think around 1910 or thereabouts, maybe, maybe later than that, but by the 20s for sure. And so there was a lot of that going on as well, where you've got these associations who are banding together under a brand name like Diamond for the walnuts, for Sunkiss for oranges, and being able to market and promote their products to be shipped out. Just a huge part of our economic growth and development out here as was oil. So I mentioned a little bit about the Los Angeles uh, area with the West side in particular, and there was just tremendous development all over greater Los Angeles. The very first oil fields coming in in what was called the San Fernando field from the 1860s, that would be in the Santa Clarita area. But after the LA oil field, you started to see a lot of, of movement to the Southeast in particular. So Doheny who had broken open the LA field in 1897, he brought in a well at what was called Olinda now in the city of Brea. So that was Orange County's first oil development. Signal Hill being one of the most uh, productive fields of all. You can see a gusher being brought in among the forest of Derricks. Other examples, Huntington Beach, Santa Fe Springs being pretty significant. The Temple family benefited from this as well. They had a lease with Standard Oil, now Chevron, and Standard began drilling in this location of the Montebello Hills in 1917, shortly after bringing in a test well owned by the, the daughters and heirs of Lucky Baldwin. Now this whole Baldwin, the whole Montebello Hills area had been owned by the Temple family prior to the mid 1870s, lost by uh, a loan foreclosure to Baldwin, the loan going to the Temple and Workman Bank, which failed. And ironically enough, decades later, there is oil found on the Baldwin side, but Walter Temple had happened to purchase a small amount of that property from the Baldwin estate several years before, not knowing, maybe hoping, there was oil there. And sure enough, this is one of the temple wells. Uh, they had one, number nine, and this might be it, that was a, a gusher. It had 30,000 barrels a day for a while. It was the biggest well in America for a few seconds. And of course, this gentleman's got to take a nice long bath after being part of that. And then again, suburban real estate. So I mentioned the town of Temple, just another photo of that. This is Dana Point, one of many new residential uh, subdivisions, kind of outlying areas. San Clemente was another one out in Orange County. And there were many others, uh, lots and lots of these, Tarzana and the San Fernando Valley being a good example, uh, many others in that particular area, especially after water was brought in from the Los Angeles aqueduct in 1913. It really opened the floodgates literally to allowing these places to be able to develop, especially closer to Los Angeles. Now going back to some of the activities for leisure outside of the city of LA, one of the, the, the best playgrounds we had, unfortunately, which is seen these days so much going on with fires. I was just hearing that that fire, the Bobcat fires, over 115,000 acres in the San Gabriel Mountains, which is just staggering in scope. But from the late 1890s through the mid to late 1930s is what they called the great hiking era, where Americans in droves were going out and enjoying the outdoors. Now there's risk to that, of course, it's just damage to the environment and, and risks of building things in, in forest areas where you have floods and fires that could be an issue that certainly happened here but people did really flock to these areas and enjoy that. You can see one example of a large group up in the San Gabriel Mountains. I've forgotten exactly where this is. I think it might be in San Gabriel Canyon, a trio of uh, female hikers uh, in the same general area. So this was an area that was getting a lot of attention for leisure during this period. Again, you can see another example, you know, mass uh, groups of hiking up at Mount Wilson, which has been threatened by that Bobcat fire, a large hotel. There were lots of resort camps throughout the San Gabriel, the Arroyo Seco. San Gabriel Canyon, um, uh, the big Santa Anita Canyon, places like that. And so it was a really interesting period to see the dramatic development and change of how people enjoyed the mountains for leisure. And the same thing really applied to our beaches too. So whereas in the, in the 19th century, there wasn't that much interest in people going to the beach and going in the water and sunbathing, it just, it, it wasn't really that big a thing until you got maybe towards the end of that period and into the 20th century. But by the 20s, you're seeing people enjoying this in droves. So whether it's, uh, you know, Venice, Santa Monica, I'm not sure what this location is, but it's a great shot where people are wearing their coats and ties and, and basically their Sunday best, it seems like, and then heading out to the beach to enjoy 
that are picnic, uh, all throughout the Los Angeles basin, basically from Malibu down to San Clemente, you start seeing lots and lots of activity going on, whether that's hotels in the early days out to the residential development, uh, say the 20s and later on. Uh, another couple of examples, this is Laguna Beach and Newport Beach in Orange County. You can see residential here, whether it's second homes or not, people are starting to develop closer uh, to these areas and oil as well. So Huntington Beach was one of those where people started to see derricks of oil wells right next to where people were sunbathing uh, during this period. There are other attractions to bring up outside of Los Angeles too. So one that uh, we hear a lot about today and was just starting to be developed in the 20s was the Huntington Library Art Gallery and Botanical Gardens. They have now changed the middle part of that to art galleries because they have several of them. But you can see the, the, the large mansion that the Huntington family, Henry and his wife Arabella built. And after she died in 1924, they opened up the library that was not too far from the house and began having that open on a limited basis. And then after Henry Huntington died in 1927, uh, early the next year in 28, they began to open up the house to show some of the art treasures as well. So it started to become a pretty popular place, even though Huntington had been warned by his advisors prior to this, that there was no way a museum that far away from the East and Midwest would be successful. And of course, here we are about 100 years later almost, and it, it's done quite well. Also big attractions were some of the, the so-called relics of the Spanish and Mexican periods. So we're talking about uh, the missions, for example. This is the San Gabriel mission, which had a devastating fire not that long ago, but a very popular place to go. Um, and the other missions locally, San Juan Capistrano and San Fernando were as well. Some adobe uh, structures. Yeah, go ahead. We've got a question from Sunny uh, regarding oil. She's just curious if there are still any oil fields around the homestead. Around the homestead, there really never were that many very close to it. The closest ones that were producing were up off of where Harbor Boulevard becomes Fullerton Road in Roland Heights. Uh, those are long gone. Uh, so those really are the closest. So there's maybe a couple still producing over on the Whittier side of the Pointe Hills, a few over in Montebello Hills. But they're, throughout the region, the oil wells are going away. I live in Carbon Canyon between Orange and San Bernardino counties, and they're removing uh, the last oil wells at Olinda right now uh, to build housing. So, yeah, we're seeing less and less of that. But around the homestead, not too many. Walter Temple did have a lease executed with an oil company in the 20s to do some tests and explorations, but it didn't go very far. Okay, so a couple of examples of local missions. This is at San Fernando, some visitors there. They made some improvements actually to that so that people could uh, go to the old mission. It had been kind of run down prior to the 20s and they uh, made some, some changes to it to make it more palatable for tourists. This is Thomas Temple, one of the Temple family members and a couple of friends down at San Capistrano uh, in the 20s as well. So people were, were enjoying these, even if they didn't necessarily get what we would refer to as an accurate historical picture of life on the missions. And I'll make some reference to that towards the end as well. And lastly, as an outline place, just another example that was becoming a lot more popular as you got from the late 19th and into the 20th century. The Banning family owned Catalina Island from the late 19th century into just, just before 1920s. And uh, even before that, they'd been privately owned. The workmen's and temples actually had mining that they were doing on the, on the southern side of the island back in the 1860s. But it became increasingly a more popular destination for tourists. Now, if you were to look at a photo of, of Avalon here at the end of the 1800s and early 1900s, you'd mostly see tents and maybe a, a, a wooden hotel here and there. But by the 20s, it was becoming not just a development for those kinds of things, hotels and, and what have you, but also people building second homes, maybe even living there full time, and of course, in some cases but it's becoming a much larger developed area. The, uh, I mentioned before that Wrigley bought the island, again, I think right at the end of the 1910s and invested a huge amount of money in development there, uh, different types, not just bringing the Cubs for spring training, but having uh, a, 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 a aviary and kind of a small zoo and building a, the Chimes Memorial back at the back of the canyon, uh, having access for people to be, do some hiking, stuff like that. So there was a, a tremendous amount of expansion. I didn't put a photo here, but the casino that was built at the end of this section on the west side of the harbor was completed in 1929. And it was a pretty dramatic thing. And there was a lot of hope that it would bring more tourism. But of course, the Great Depression came along and it wasn't quite as successful as they had hoped. 
This was also the second home of a famous Western writer, not as well known today, Zane Gray, who built a Pueblo style structure right about here uh, in this section of the photograph. So uh, that was a hotel until not that long ago. And there's talk about uh, bringing it back as a hotel there. The temple's children actually went to school with Zane Gray's son out in Pasadena. And they visited this house when it was completed during the 1920s period. So just some examples again of the kinds of activity people would have in the suburban areas of Los Angeles. Now, inevitably, what happens when you talk about an area in a certain period of time is you're going to have people who aren't talked about. Or if they are, it's kind of in a romanticized way or sanitized way. So I wanted to close with some examples of that because we, we get lots of photographs and documents about, frankly, white residents of greater Los Angeles and not as much about other people, different ethnic groups. And also there's a, a gender part of that too, which I'll refer to briefly. So people would have known in this area, tourists and residents about Grauman's Chinese theater. And that, that idea of the exotic was very popular. It wasn't just Asian, it could be any other you know, type of exotic uh, group that were out there. Uh, there's a lot of architecture, for example, that was sort of Mayan influenced or Egyptian influenced. And so this is an element where you'd see a lot more reference to something like this, but not a lot said about the actual Chinatown or Chinese community of Los Angeles. Now in this period, the Chinatown was still across from the plaza and that would be raised and the Chinatown moved to its current location when Union Station was built. They were planning Union Station during the twenties. It didn't get completed until 1939. But again, comparing or contrasting photos like this is a reminder of what you see as kind of the Hollywood or surface level view of things as opposed to a little more in depth. Similarly here, I mentioned the Bernheimers. Now they were very, very fascinated by Japanese art and culture, uh, gardens, that sort of thing. And they, they went to a lot of trouble and expense to recreate as accurately as possible that. So their intent was obviously good. But again, it's the idea that if people knew anything at all about the Japanese in, in the Los Angeles area during these years, it was probably something like this, rather than knowing Japanese people. And Little Tokyo was a very small part of downtown in those years. But again, photos like this, we've got a number of these that just show Japanese residents of the area. Now, this beach may have very well, almost certainly was limited to people of ethnic uh, minorities who could not go to other, other beaches because those were exclusively for uh, Caucasians. But again, it's just contrasting these, these differences that we see. This is another example of this. So it could be about native history or Spanish and Mexican history. These were very popular photos. We have a few examples of this. This gentleman here was called Chief Manito and he was basically a attraction at San Gabriel Mission. You could go have your photo taken with and put on these costumes. Now, of course, these are feathered headdresses from the plains of the Midwestern part of the United States, nothing to do whatsoever with California or its indigenous Aboriginal people. But that's how they sold history at a place like this. Completely not accurate. And of course, not reflecting the, the lives of the natives who were here. Similarly, if you were gonna go to a place like this and, and hear about the Spanish and Mexican period, you'd get a romanticized view about that. Whereas just a couple miles away, you're gonna find laborers, families coming from Mexico, especially after the revolution in 1910, looking for a better life, were working in those fields. So this is a walnut grove in El Monte. This could be La Puente or any other place like it. And it's just a, a big contrast. And so what you see in a public venue is obviously very different than what you're going to see in, in real life. Another example, this is a photo in our collection of two theatrical performers in blackface. And this was very common. People went to these performances a lot. Minstrel shows were very popular among white Americans. And it's just kind of stunning to see how open a lot of this was, not even just the blackface part of it, just references to black people in general. And so we're confronting a lot of that today. You see a lot of product packages now that are, there's a lot of change going on with things like that. And we're talking a century later almost. But there were elements of black Los Angeles where people were engaged in upbuilding their community. And this is an example of the hotel Somerville, which was completed in, in the late 1920s on central Avenue where the black community had been moving further and further South 
that they had been originally, the, the small black community had been centered in what is now Little Tokyo and then followed Central Avenue down uh, increasingly over time. Now the Somerville Hotel did not succeed as that. It became the Dunbar, but over decades, it wound up becoming a, a core element of African-American Los Angeles uh, music, uh, you know, people who were involved in different aspects of the professional world of black Los Angeles found this area to be really the core of their community in many ways. And with women too. So it was, it was uh, in terms of the public world, most people in Los Angeles would probably relate to the film stars of that time. This is Colleen Moore. It could be even Latina actors like Dolores del Rio uh, and uh, Lupe Velez. But that's pretty much how most people understood woman and public life was through celebrity or through entertainment like this. Whereas there were other women who were doing things that are, were notable, but tend to get forgotten. Mary Foy, for example, who was an early woman librarian in the city of Los Angeles. She was also an early woman delegate to the ne Democratic National Conventions of the 1920s. Mary Julia Workman, who was a grandniece of the Workman family from the homestead, was very involved in civic and public life in the 1920s. Settlement houses, uh, Catholic charities. She was honored by the Pope in 1925. Now, again, these are white upper class women. That isn't to say that there weren't women of color who weren't involved in things. In fact, uh, going back to the Somervilles, just briefly, Veda Somerville was very, very actively involved in women's groups and formed a club specifically like the, the white women's clubs, say the Friday Morning Club or other examples, so they could have their platform for talking about politics, social betterment, that sort of thing. So for us at the Homestead, what we try to do in this, this 1920s era is, as much as we can, put the families in context. So all those things we've been talking about may, may not be directly related to the families in terms of they live there or they work with those people or they developed a business in that area. In some cases, that's true. Walter Temple had oil projects throughout greater Los Angeles, Huntington Beach, Signal Hill, which I mentioned earlier. He had building projects in downtown Los Angeles. He was involved in Alhambra and El Monte and San Gabriel. But even the context of it is an opportunity for us to compare and contrast their lives with others at that time period. And then more importantly, perhaps, is how can we translate some of that to what is happening now? So we are obviously in 2020. We've got a decade ahead of us to spend a lot of time talking about the centennial of things over the course of the next uh, nine or 10 years. So hopefully we'll see some more examples of that in person, not too distant future and not having to do it virtually. But the idea again, as we conclude here is just how to take the homestead as a historic site in a given area of the city of industry, but look at it in a broader perspective because the families were involved in so many areas of greater Los Angeles, but also they live in a context. They're not in a bubble. They live among people and it's good to go back and, and look and, and contrast with that. And then for those of us today to be able to look back at that and see how our lives have changed as well. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up and take any further questions. And uh, Alex, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Paul. Uh, let's see, we've got something in the chat coming in here. All right, we've just got comments saying, this was great, thank you so much. I love the Homestead Museum blog posts. Great, thank you. Yeah. And, and while we're waiting for any other questions, I'll just, I want to show you the slide, uh, the screen here. So we have upcoming events. So Jenny Trulock uh, of our staff has been doing a fantastic job with the Female Justice Series. This is going to be a really, really fascinating case of Clara Phillips, the Tiger Lady. You'll need to tune in to find out why she was called the Tiger Lady. I think I'm going to have to do something with a claw. But I'll let Jenny talk about that later. Uh, Wednesday, the 21st, we have a, a great fiction book club, uh, Jennifer. Uh, uh, from our staff has been overseeing this and it's literature of the progressive era. So enjoy that. That is eight o'clock, by the way. I'm not sure why I put it that there. And then on Friday the 30th, we have a nonfiction book club where they're talking about the very timely topic of suffrage and women's rights. This is uh, moderated by one of our volunteers, Tony Scirocco, and great, great discussions about uh, the, the nonfiction side of things. So you can see our sign up uh, address here for those events. And of course, we are very active on social media. Alex, uh, in particular, has been shepherding that uh, recently. So you can follow us on these platforms. 